Kita. Okay. Now I'll do um, share screen. Close. I, uh, since you guys um, are interested in Marcy, I'll, I'll, I don't want to do that actually since I'm recording. So we've got some nice pictures of Marcy. Uh, yeah. Lovely pictures. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, I know for, uh, five out of 20. That's pretty good. That's all right. That's all right. Yeah. Um, I don't know why my photos are not. It's, it's uploading. Okay. So it's now uploaded. Now I need to done. I think Maybe my phone was closed. I think you maybe need to open to to. Um, I'll, I'll I'll give you a brief look at Marcy first of all. Right. So right now I share. Share screen. Close. So. Oh. Oh. So I, uh, you know, I got my phone up like with it and says, let's look at this here and, and um, she's grown up. Yes, yeah, she's really, she's really, <laughs> I said, show, I said, smile at the camera. Why don't you smile and show us your teeth? So then she was laughing at herself laughing, you see? Oh dear, she's adorable. Yeah. So there you go. That was a wee bit of fun. Uh, I think, I think, I don't, I, it's probably not uploaded yet, but I, I think I took a video as well. I don't know where that is. Yeah, that's probably not uploaded yet. Um, smile, smile. So I'm, I'm tough. Ready, steady, go. Smile, team. <laughs> She was very good anyway. It was very good. I had a really good time with her. <laughs> so, yeah, okay. Well, there was one I couldn't get. And it annoyed me that I couldn't get that one. But, well, we'll, we'll look at these words together, right? So, um, hey, Angeli. Oh, she hasn't joined yet. Um why don't we do the words that you know first of all and then we'll go through the others so what what are the ones that you know elham uh i know uh, massacre yeah uh, i knew the uh a c uh meaning large scale killing i know this one Yes, that's correct. That's correct. Um, and 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 what and other? The, ones, you know? the third one, cynicism. The habitual doubt. I know this one too. Yeah. Yeah, habitual doubt's not a great um, definition of cynicism. We'll 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 come back to a proper definition of these words in a little bit, but it's the right answer certainly. Um, next one. Okay, I'm sorry, I have a 
um, background noise. I it's don't right. know what, what is this. Don't worry. No worries. No worries. What was the next one after cynicism? Experimental. I know this one too. Like right. harmful. Detrimental. Detrimental. Yeah. 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 And also accessible. Accessible. Yeah. As uh, approachable. Correct. Yep. And uh, uh, the last one is the uh, the road. Rouge, maybe. We pronounce it rouge. 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 Yeah. yeah. So that's French. Yeah, the um, deception meaning. I knew this one. You know, really? See, I would have said C, but I. I'm probably wrong. I'm right, reddish powder. Yeah. Okay. Um, what were do you were you thinking about then? Um, I'm not quite sure what uh, you're thinking of there. Deception. I I, I may have uh, I may have read it somewhere in a book or something. Yeah, so yeah, maybe my memory is yeah, uh, yeah. Helping. Uh, it's in the back of my mind what you're thinking of there. Um, yeah, I'm finished. I don't know any yeah, other yeah. one. Okay, I think I think you may be thinking of right, right. Somebody was righted. You know. Mm -hmm. Um. Right, so we'll go through these words, right? This is kind of a little bit of fun. I'll say hi to Anjali, first of all. Nice to see you, my dear. Hi, so hi. Hi, everyone. All right. Hi, Anjali. Um, last, last week, I actually forgot to join the class. And today, I just checked the message, and I saw that, okay, the class is live. So yeah. I'm late. I'm sorry for that. That's all right. That's all right. It's nice to see you. Um. Can you do me one favor, Anjali? Can you just WhatsApp Shweta for me? Um, oh, okay. Just to see in case she's forgotten, right? Um, she told me last week she couldn't join last week, but generally she's quite keen. So just, just, just remind, just remind her. Okay. Okay. I'm All right. That. Thanks. Right. So we'll go through these words. Um, they will be all new pretty much to you, Mona. Um, Anjali will know a few of these, I think. Okay. Um, so massacre, first of all, let's do massacre. So massacre is a large scale killing, right? So people talk about, you know, the massacre of the Jews in the Second World War, as an example, right? Or yes. the, the massacre of the Kurds, for example, um, under Saddam Hussein, right? That was a massacre, um, you know, but it can also be, you know, it, it's of multiple people. It doesn't have to be millions of people, right? It can be, you know, like 10 people were massacred, right? But essentially it's where there's a killing of multiple people. So that's what a massacre is. So um, it's the pronunciation is, Massacre, massacre, massacre. Okay. Um, right. The second word then is tantalize. And to tantalize is to tease. Right. Yeah. And the correct answer there is A, tease. Yeah. And to tantalize. It's the tease, but also like the tempt. I think there's a there's a there's a there's a there's a good dose of temptation and te and tease put in there as well, right? So, um, an example sentence might be: He was tantalized by the smell of the curry. Yeah. Um, or you know, he was tantalized by the promise of riches. Yeah. 
so you get the idea so let's look at um a dictionary definition as well um And what I'll do is I'll try and do a share screen where I can share two photos and then shift the browser. Share. So I'm sharing two screens now. So if we go to this one, I've got, I've got Google up on my screen. Can you guys see that? Can you see Google? Yeah. Yeah. Right, so tantalized, define tantalized, to tease or torment by presenting something desirable to the, to the view and a frustrating expectation by keeping it out of reach. Yeah, that's a great definition. That's, that's perfect. So, you know, here's this thing, but you can't have it, right? That's what tantalized is. And you can see uh, they're using the word not just tease, but torment, to just torment somebody. So you're doing it deliberately. Exciting expectations, hopes or fears. Right. But you're holding it back. Tantalize. It's a good word. Tantalize. Tantalize. Right. Third one. Cynicism. Now. I reckon Anjali will know this word. Uh, Elham knew it. Um, do you know this word, Anjali? Yeah, I've read it somewhere in the yeah. newspaper or something. And what's what's the answer? I don't remember the meaning, but okay. so I I have read it somewhere. Okay, so cynicism. It comes from the word cynic, right? Now, cynic um, is like a skeptic, someone who is skeptical, right? A cynic is something, is somebody who has a, here's another good word, predilection, come back to that, predilection, that's a really good word, um, which means that they have a, a bias, if you like, to not believe somebody else, right, or, or anything, you know, they're just, people can be described as the ultimate cynic, so let's talk about cyn a cynic before we talk about cynicism, right, so Define cynic. A person who believes that people are motivated purely by self-interest rather than acting for honorable or unselfish reasons. A member of a school of ancient Greek philosophers founded by Antistines. This is new to me. You know that? Marked by an ostentatious contempt for ease and pleasure. The movement flourished in the third century BC and revived in the first century AD. So I would have called that kind of person a stoic. Rather than a cynic. So that's kind I think of there is a philosophy in Greece, Stoicism, I think we say Stoicism. Stoicism, yeah, Stoicism, yeah. See, if we go to that, let's just define Stoic. A person who can endure pain and hardship without showing the feelings of complaining, a member of the ancient philosophical school of Stoicism, um, So let's do stoic versus cynic. So stoicism is nearly always contrasted with Epicureanism, right? Unlike cynicism, stoicism sees many human constructs like laws and customs as natural and encourages obeying them as part of living naturally. A cynic is the opposite. He does not obey anything that he does not consider good or natural. Well, that's interesting. Every day is a school day, even for teacher. No. So the Stoic then thinks that you should be lawful. 
and that's what living is, right? The cynic is the opposite. He does not obey anything. He doesn't think it's kind of good or natural, okay? Now, now let's do versus Epicureanism because that's the normal contrast to Stoic and Epicureans, right? Um, in summary, a simple heuristic to remember the difference between the Stoics and Epicureans. The Stoics cared about virtuous behavior and lived according to nature, living according to nature, while the Epicureans were all about avoiding pain and seeking natural and necessary pleasure. So essentially the Epicurean was, let's live for the moment, let's live for pleasure. The Stoic would be happy to endure pain and in fact would actually reject pleasure, okay? Uh, so that was, the, that was in ancient Greek, Greek, Grecian times. Nowadays, you, you would apply the term stoic to somebody who is philosophical, as a good word, um, about the situation they're in, right? So they're in a situation and they're, it's not a good situation. So for example, um, let's just say I have had a pain and went to the doctor and I find out I have been diagnosed with cancer. Right? Very serious situation. Somebody might say, well, what was his reaction? How, how is he? And somebody might say, he is stoic about it. Stoic, right? And that means, that, and that's seen as a virtuous thing, as a good thing, right? That it, in that it's saying that you are accepting, right? So if somebody is accepting of something that is non-desirable, unpalatable, you, you can say that they are stoic or philosophical, right? Either of those two things describe that person well. Is everybody with me? I haven't lost anybody. Yeah, yeah. it's okay. more or less the same in every, I think, philosophy. I don't know if it's philosophy or religion, but in every religion, if something bad happens to you, then we say that, okay, it, it was in destiny. What can we do? So it's like that, right? Yeah, it is. It is. Yeah. So this is definitely philo philosophy rather than religion, right? Because the Greek, mm -hmm. well, the Greeks, I mean, they were pantheists. They had multiple gods, right? You know? Um, but, but, you know, Greeks are known for their philosophy, right? That was what defined their culture. And, you know, the Areopagus in Athens, you know, its purpose was to listen to people with new ideas and thoughts, right? Um, so we got there from cynic. And I, I didn't know that a cynic was a, a Greek philosophical thing. I didn't know that, so I learned that, right? But how it's used in modern times is this. A person uh, who believes that other people are motivated by self-interest always so, so for example, let's say, you know, I'm going to give somebody somebody, right? I'm going to give them 50 pounds, right? I'm going to give somebody 50 pounds, right? And I'm doing it, it's a gesture. I'm doing it out of generosity, right? A cynic might be skeptical, right? They, they, they would say, uh, you've got an ulterior motive. Why would you do that? You know, are you trying to curry favor? Are you trying to impress other people? Why are you doing that? That would be the cynic's reaction. Does that make sense? Yeah. No, the cynic might be right or they might be wrong. Right. But whether he's right or whether he's wrong, the cynic always has that perspective, right? Always. 
And, uh, and another word I used earlier about five minutes ago when I was explaining this, I said he had a predilection. Now let me write that word out, right? Because that's a, well, actually I'll write it here, right? Uh, predilection. Predilection, I think it is. Yeah, predilection. Is a preference or a special liking for something, a bias in favor of something. Right, so here they're using an example, my predilection for Asian food. Okay, so I've got one of those, right? But how I used it in the definition was I said he has a predilection to look at something negatively with suspicion, always, right? So, you know, there, there's certain states in America, for example, where they say, uh, you know, they're all cynics there, right? Um, like people would say the Scottish are quite cynical and they are. The, the Scottish are more cynical than the English, right? Right, so, so we've got a cynic. So now let's look at cynicism which was the, what the quiz question was about, right? So cynicism is an inclination to believe that people are motivated purely by self-interest, skepticism. And you remember I used that word skepticism. I used the word skeptic when I was defining it, like a skeptic, right? So let's, let's look at this then. Let's define um, cynic versus skeptic. I don't think I want to go to LinkedIn. <clears throat> How is skepticism different from cynicism? Let me turn off my little Spanish toucan. Get to the point, man. I don't want to read an article. <laughs> Both the words skeptical cynical refer to a doubtful mood, but what is the basic difference between them? Skeptical is American spelling for skeptical with the C is English spelling. Tristan says, this is weird. I'm in India where we use British English, but I've actually never seen skeptic written anywhere, only skeptic with a K. Very interesting. Here we go. Skeptical means having reservations. Someone who's skeptical will not easily be convinced, will be hard to persuade, right? That's a good definition, yeah? Uh, the main meaning of cynical is believing the worst of people, or as Noah says, distrustful of human sincerity or integrity. I really like that definition. That's a really good definition. I guess that, that was Shweta, Joey. Shweta, do you want to go on mute, my dear? Thank you. Um, uh, as an example, in a sentence, John is skeptical about the motorway extension. You could replace skeptical with cynical without altering the meaning. In the sentence, John is skeptical about global warning, warn, warming. You could not do this change. Likewise, is, likewise in John has a cynical attitude, you would not use skeptical instead. So that gives good examples, but it doesn't really explain the why there. You're probably all lost. The, the point is cynical, cynical and skeptical are in the same universe, right? 
in the same corner of the universe. Cynical believes the worst in people, thinks that people act in the, everybody acts in self-interest. Nobody does anything altruistically. There's a really good word, altruistic. And we'll do that word in a wee minute as well. Let's just define that. Showing a disinterest and, se and selfish concern for the well-being of others. Self selfless concern for others. So altruistic would be the opposite, right? Altruistic is saying somebody does something sincerely, right? So there would only be certain people who would exhibit that behavior. But that is seen as extremely high, right? So for example, somebody who gives of their time to look after disabled people, right? Um, in a voluntary basis. They're not being paid for it and they're looking after disabled people. That's altruistic behavior, yeah? Elham, you read your hand up. Yes, uh, I want to check if I got what you said correctly. Uh, can we say uh, someone like Schopenhauer is uh, a cynic and uh, um, a guy, for example, that doubt her, his uh, wife is uh, cheating or not, uh, like, uh, I mean, like a uh, mental illness, is a skeptical? Um. Hang on just one second. Um, Mona has a problem. Um, maybe log off and on again. Uh, she can WhatsApp me, but she's she's dropped off the class. And she's got a problem. Um, so coming back to you, Elham, so give me the start of that again. So get, get, I didn't quite pick you up. Yeah, I want to check if uh, I got your, uh, you know, your definition correctly for these two words. Uh, I give two examples of uh, the man, the philosopher Schopenhauer. If he is a cynic, can we say that? And uh, um, in another scenario, if uh, a guy is uh, well, has a well, mental well, illness, well, well, one at a time, right? One at a time. Okay. okay. So one at a time, right? So, okay. um, so, yeah. So, I don't know who you're talking about there. Should I know that name? I guess so. Let me Some write. How you spell it, or are you want to write it in the? Yeah. The... Let me write. It. Okay, well, you know, I, I don't know him. I don't know what you mean. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I want to talk about the philosophy. Uh... So Arthur Schopenhauer, German, uh, 19th century, was a German philosopher. He's best known for his work, the, the World as Will and Representation, which characterized the phenomenal world as the product of a blind and insati insatiable new meaning, new word for me, well, building on the transcendental idealism of Immanuel Kant, Schopenhauer developed an atheistic metaphysical and ethical system and rejected the contemporary ideas of German idealism. He's one of the first thinkers in the Western philosophy to share and affirm significant tenets of Indian philosophy, such as asceticism, denial of the self and the notion of the world as appearance. His work has been described as an exemplary manifestation 
of philosophical pessimism. Though his work failed to garner substantial interest during his lifetime, Schopenhauer had a posthumous impact across various disciplines, including philosophy, literature, and science. His writing on aesthetics, morality, and psychology have influenced many thinkers and artists. Those who cited his influence include Nietzsche, Wittgenstein, Schrodinger, and Einstein. Wow. Okay. Right, we now know who he is. Um, so I think what you're saying is, is he an example of someone who is like a Stoic? Is that your question? Uh, no, because uh, as it was written there, uh, he, he was a pessimist uh, uh, philosopher. So I was uh, thinking if he is cynic or he's a skeptical. You know, uh, uh, actually, it is not important <laughs> or how he is. Yeah. I want to uh, I want to make sure I have understood the main the difference between the two words. Yeah. Okay. No, we'll we'll, we'll come back to that. Right. We'll come back to okay. that. Okay. Okay. Um. So we've seen this one. Oh, this is quite nice. Here's a wee diagram. Someone who's helpfully drawn. Hope and doubt. So the cynic and the skeptic, the skeptic um, are both very doubtful in any situation, but the skeptic has more hope where the, the cynic does not, right? So um, so they're both negative. So for example, um, you know, you know, let's say Biden, Joe Biden makes his inaugural speech um, to begin his five-year term. Somebody who was cynical would just be very negative about everything he said. Um, where the skeptic will, will say, I don't think he'll achieve what he's promising, but we'll see. Before we've looked at this, by the way, I couldn't have told you that, right? Because the, as I said earlier, these things are in the same ballpark, right? These words are very similar in meaning. But the, 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 the cynic, it would seem is die hard negative, right? They can't but be negative. Where the skeptic, the skeptic is negative, but he, he, he's not fixed. A person who's cynical generally has a very bad outlook in life, very little faith in others. A person skeptical is more likely to put in the appropriate research before believing what they're told. That's a nice way of thinking about it. Someone who is cynical usually assumes people are right to screw them. Someone who is skeptical understands there are bad people out there and that is why we must be careful and deliberate in our decisions. Right, so that's, these are, these are different people offering opinions, right? So it's quite good. I, I like this definition, right? This is, this is all positive, right? This is all very good, I, I think. The meaning of cynical is, this is let's see what this next person says. The meaning of cynical is believing that only selfishness motivates human actions, not believing in disinterested points of view, feeling uncertain if someone will happen if something will happen or if it's worth the effort spent. To showing contempt for accepted standards of honesty and morality by one's actions, pessimistic. Where's your pessimism coming in, right? The meaning of skeptical is having, showing doubt, denying or questioning the tenets of religion. Yeah, that's true. Uh, regarding the doctrines of opinion of philosophical skeptics, the words have different meanings even in the case that they both mean having doubts, right? Right, so they both mean that. Cynical has a more specific meaning. 
The examples reported from the NOAD of sentences containing cynical and skeptical are the following. Most residents are cynical about efforts to clean mobsters out of their city. He gave a cynical laugh. Stalin had stuck a cynical deal, had struck a cynical deal with Hitler. The public were deeply skeptical about some of the proposals. Hi, Mona. Will you see? Hi, teacher. Yeah, you're back. Thank you. So th this has been quite an interesting um, rabbit hole we've gone down um, on one of the words in the quiz. Um, I think it's very interesting. So, so it's 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 fairly clear to me now. I don't think I could have actually told you if you'd asked me blind what the difference between them is. I don't think I could have told you. I don't think most people in in Britain or America could tell you the difference between the two off the top of their head. They're very close. And they're very, very close. But it's clear to me that the cynic is a die hard negative person and is suspicious of others, doesn't believe anyone does anything other than for selfish, self interested reasons. The skeptic is negative coming into something, but can be convinced or can do some research and alter their opinion where the cynic cannot. That seems to be the prevailing opinion coming through there. Is that, is that clear, Elham? Are you comfortable with that? Yes. Okay. Thank you. So you're, you're not a cynic. Me? Yeah, you're not a cynic. <laughs> no. <laughs> you're definitely not a cynic. But you can be skeptical sometimes. <laughs> I am. <laughs> and that's good. A, 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 a wee bit of skepticism is, is, is healthy. Right. Woo! We, we, that was, what a detour that was. Now, did we deal, I think, did we deal with all the wee, other wee rabbit holes? I think we did. Yeah, altruistic, just to clear, to clear on that one. So altruistic is kind of the opposite of these things, right? The altruistic is showing selfless concern for other people, unselfish. So we can talk about altruism, altruism, or altruistic behavior. Okay, just to complete the to complete the picture. Now let's go back to our quiz. We're only in number three. <laughs> Right, next one, inaugural. I actually mentioned this word um, by accident there a moment ago when I was talking about Biden. Inaugural. Um, what do you think the answer is, anyone? Angeli might know this one. No. No? I know. Inauguration, I know. Inauguration we do in the college. Exactly. To begin something. Exactly. Right? Precisely. Precisely. So inaugural, the answer then is first. Yeah. D. Yeah. D. Inaugural. Mm -hmm. It's it's the beginning of something. So you can talk about inaugurating a president or inaugurating a queen or inaugur inaugurating your students into college. Um my inaugural presentation, my inaugural speech. Uh, an interesting word similar is debut. Yeah. So let's, let's look that up, right? So um, inaugural versus debut. Because off the top of my head, I couldn't really tell you the difference between those two because they're, again, they're in the same ballpark, right? So this is English, right? English has got lots of words. Um,
So again, this is the first, right? The first appearance in public as a performer is your debut, right? So his acting debut on Broadway, that is a very classic statement, right? First time appearance in particular capacity made his major league debut, her debut as a director, a first publication, the band released three singles from their debut. And the formal presentation of a young woman to society. So when a woman was reached a certain age, this is, this is not modern times, this is old times, right? If you read Dickens novels or Charlotte Bronte novels, you'll talk, they'll talk about the day, so-and-so's debut, right? Angelie's debut, right? So that would be when Angeli is being brought out of the home setting where she has been protected, brought up, and she's being presented to society as eligible to be married. <laughs> that would be your oh, debut, yeah. <laughs> and if you read like the Bronte girls, right, their novels, it's all about that, right? It's all about who's going to marry who, <laughs> right? Well, that's all a bit of fun, but it doesn't really answer the core question, which is what's the difference between inaugural versus debut, right? The difference between first and inaugural is that first is ridge of roof, while inaugural is an inauguration. First is ridge of roof. What is it talking about? That's pathetic. Ignore that. Marking the beginning, first of a projected series. Synonyms. Inauguration, induction, initiation, investiture. When you start a new company, when you start a job, they talk about an induction, right? Which is your first series of information about the company. Okay, so we're not seeing words that are linking it um, with debut, but trust me, these words are very similar. The act of inaugurating especially a ceremonial induction into office. Debut, a first appearance, a formal entrance into society. Can we say that debut is with respect to people or person and uh, inauguration is with respect to events? With respect to what? The last word you With used? respect to events. Events? Yeah. Yeah, but debut is often to do with an event as well. Like, you know, my debut, you know. But we always say in in the in context of a person, right? We always yeah. like use a person when whenever we use the word debut. You're right. You're right. But but the 
so so is inaugurate often you know you talk about you know his inauguration you're talking about a person right so i find it hard to distinguish between these I, i've done a bad job here right but these words are very similar very similar okay um at least i've made you aware of that right um you'll notice that debut i'll write it in here debut is pronounced like french debut it's not debut right it's not debit mm -hmm. right this word here d-a-b-i-t is debit right debit and credit but d-u-b-u-t is debut right debut now genuflect is a good one um when we did this last week at the barbecue we were doing this for a bit of fun um and uh, my boys didn't know genuflect but i did so i was pleased about that um does anybody know what genuflect means this is a good word to know and the related word genuflection um, what, what did you think angeli it's new new no, to you yeah okay right so to genuflect is to bend a knee um and so it can be physically to genuflect or it also can be showing deference um genuflect showing deference Do you know what deference means no all right let's do genuflect first to bend the knee to touch the knee to the floor especially in worship genuflected before the altar to be humbly obedient or respectful now this definition here is what's used mostly like we don't often you don't often see somebody bending the knee right right but if there were some people going in to appear before the queen you could say they would they would they would genuflect before her but we we all don't see that happening very often right so but this is used a lot right to be subservient to somebody else, right? As we talk about genuflection, um, we also we also use it in a very skeptical way as well by talking about weaning genuflection. Um, Did I spell that wrong? Oh, I did. So I am sure this is an expression. Maybe it's not, maybe it's this thing. Weaning, see it is a word. I didn't make it up. It is archaic. Be of the opinion, think or suppose. He I ween is no sacred personage. Um, I 
the point is when somebody um you could talk about affected genuflection right in other words it's put on i'm pretending to be subservient but I'm not really subservient, right? Um, so that's genuflection. Bend the knee, but also can just mean subservient, serving somebody else. Meli is a good word. Meli, Meli, it's helping you how to pronounce it here, Meli. Right, this is basically D, a noisy fight, right? And it's actually a French word. There should be a circumflex in it, right? So, a confused struggle, especially hand-to-hand -hand fight among several people. Right. So the boxing fans came out of the venue and they were shouting at one another and it turned into a melee, melee, right? Where they were like fighting with one another. Melee. 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 You have to learn to say that because it's not a very common word, but most people would know what it means. But you wouldn't say it. Mille has French roots. You could also say fracas or brawl. I've never heard of the word Donnybrook in my life. There are many English words for confused and noisy fights. In the 17th century, melee was thrown into the mix. It comes from the French melee, which in turn comes from Old French misle, meaning mixture. Misle comes from the Old French of mesler or medler, which means to mix. This verb is also a source of medley, mixture or hodgepodge, and medal to mix oneself in, other, in others' affairs. Melee. A verbal disagreement at the football game turned into a general melee involving a score of spectators. You'd think I'd read that ahead of time, wouldn't you? <laughs> I promise you I didn't. <laughs> right? That's a classic example, right? Sports fans fighting, you know, for no good reason other than one team lost to another and often the other team will jibe at them, you know, and make fun of them. And that just gets people's tempers up and so it turns into a fight well let's just sort this out yeah uh, and often you know there's alcohol involved so people's judgment is impaired and it ends up in fisticuffs and arrests and black eyes and all sorts you don't want to be involved in a melee brawl is much more common Fraca is pretty common. Donny Brick, I honestly, a fray, fray is uh, is pretty common. Donny Brick, man alive, I have never heard that word. Free for all brawl. I, I usually public quarrel or dispute. Donny Brick. So it's actually the name of a city in Ireland. Example sentences. A Donny Brook has erupted over the court's decision. A dozen people were arrested after Donny Brook at the stadium. Well, in my short life, I have never read that word before. If I've read it, I didn't know what it meant. I've never looked it up. I could never have guessed that. Donny Brook.
That doesn't really tell me. Uh, okay, so it comes from a Donnybrook Fair, which is a notoriously disorderly event held annually from 1204 until the middle of the 19th century. The town of Donnybrook comes from the Irish Domnach Broch. Okay. So there you go. You could never have guessed that, right? You just would have to know that. A brawl or fracas, a scene of chaos. That's a good word to know. Don't, don't you think? Is that a good word to know? No. I, I will use this word now, now that I know <laughs> it. But honestly, most people will have no clue what you mean. But if you say brawl, everyone got you. Yeah, Fracca, everybody knows that. Um, melee, people know that, though it's less common. People, people know that. Okay, so we've had a melee in peril. Now this is, this is easy because it's just the opposite of peril, right? Or no, it's not the opposite of peril. It's to put somebody in peril is what in peril means, right? So the answer is A, to put at risk, okay? It's not to push forward. It's not to disagree. It's not to shout. To in peril is to put at risk, right? So um, I imperil the lives of the family because I took them out in a boat and the fog came in and we got lost. We were lost at sea. So I imperiled, imperiled the lives of the family. Um, I, 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 I see that Elham has asked the question there, genuflect, like what men do to propose a woman. Yes, that would be described as genuflection, yeah. Um, however, when a man does that, he is not doing it in a spirit of obedience, right? He's doing it in a spirit of making an earnest request, which is not really the same. So genuflection, it's a bowing of the knee in the sense of subservience. That's not what a man's doing when he buys the knee before a woman, right? He'd be doing that if he was doing it in front of the queen because he would recognize her superiority in office, but not in front of his fiance. If he buys the need for a fiance, he's not saying, I want to worship you, I want to serve you. <laughs> he's not saying that. He's saying, I would really love you to be my wife. Would you please? Got it? Cool. Right. Now this next word, number eight, hackneyed, is a brilliant word. I love this word. This is an Allen word, hackneyed. And it means stale, right? Hackneyed. It's got nothing to do with hacking, hacking computers. But hackneyed means, I mean, it, it's saying stale, but I would say tired. But not tired in the sense of being physically tired. You know, I wouldn't say I'm, I'm hackneyed. But to mean I'm tired, you wouldn't say that, but tired in the sense of something is old, right? So like you could talk about a hackneyed argument. There you go, a tired argument, right? Uh, you know, so it's, it's, you know, or a hackneyed expression, a hackneyed phrase. If you're writing something and you want to make it original, you won't want to have any cliches in it, cliches, and you won't want to have any ex hackneyed expressions. So let's, let's look up this word, hackneyed. Yeah. 
repeated too often. Synonyms, banal, commonplace, cliched, shop-worn, stock, threadbare, time-worn, tired, trite, unoriginal, well-worn. The sermon was full of hackneyed phrases and platitudes. Big thumbs down, see? Now, I've learned something, right? In London, we talk about hackney, hackney taxis. And I have Sorry, ne- hackney, Hack- hackney, yeah, hack, hack, hackney cabs. Let's look at that. Right. We talk about a hackney cab, right? What's a hackney cab? Hackney carriage. A London taxi, right? That, that, see that red, that black car and that shape, old fashioned shape, right? That's, well, that's what we call a hackney cab or hackney carriage, right? If you come to London, you get a taxi, that's what you get into. And they're that shape because you can take five people in it. So there's, there's three seats at the back and there's two seats this way facing. It's a nice way, if you come to London, you have to get into Hackney Cab and travel around London. And these guys know every street in London in their head. They don't use, they don't use a phone and Google, right? It's all in their head. And to become a taxi driver, you have to sit an exam. It's called, I think it's called the knowledge. And you, you have to, if, if, you get asked like randomly, where is this such and such a street? And you have to be able to tell the answer where the street is and how to get to it from wherever you are. It's a very, very tough exam. Um, so in order to become a taxi driver in London, you can't just be able to drive a car. You need to be able to demonstrate intimate knowledge a completely thorough knowledge of the city so we got there we got there from hackneyed i didn't know this i i've never equated that you see it says it's dated meaning let out for hire so the hackney cab is a hackney cab because it's let out for hire i didn't know that right that's that's new to me, right? Every day is a school day. Um, and what if a person owns a car and he wants to become a driver in London? Can, can he do that? He, yeah, he can become an Uber driver. Because to become an Uber driver, all you need is to sign up with Uber and have a phone, right? And they'll, they'll accept you. No problem. But that's not the same as the taxi cab. Okay. The taxi cabs, you typically hail them on the street, right? You put your hand out if one's coming down the street. Um, you, you see this bit here, this is taxi, right? And it lights up if he's free. If the light's off, he's not free. And if one of these is going down the street, you can put your hand out and they'll stop for you and give you a lift wherever you wanna go. And they're safe, by the way, they're safe for women they're very well monitored, you know. Um, Uber's pretty safe as well. There are other cabs. Um, what's the, t- the term for those? And they're not safe. You don't get into those if you're a woman. It, uh, can, is, it, is it more reputed when, like, is it more reputed than the Uber or something? If you order an Uber, it'll never be one of these guys, right? These guys are separate. These guys are the official taxis that have been on the go for decades. Uber's a modern thing. Yeah. Um, so people are like competing for the exam to become a taxi driver. Yeah. Oh, that's strange. If you're competing for the exam, it, it's all books. It's nothing to do with driving. Good 
Yeah, mini cabs, that's what you call them, mini cabs. You don't get into a mini cab if you're a female on your own. Right? But you can get into a hackney carriage, you're safe. So there, there's the thing, the knowledge that I was talking about. That's the exam. Okay. Right. Uh, so hackneyed, um, you can see is a very negative word that means that something is, uh, I said tired or cliche. It's been said too often, too much. That's what hackneyed means. Great word, love that word. Absolutely love that word. That's what hackneyed means. How are we doing? We're number eight. We're slow, aren't we? Witticism, right? A witticism is a funny remark. Okay, a funny remark. It's witty. So we talk about wit. And wit is the ability to make a short, trite comment that is right on cue. So politicians who are good at wit and witticism tend to be very powerful in parliament, right? Because it's this, this ability of repartee and be able to come back very quickly when someone makes a comment, you come back and you say something, it's a stinging remark, right? That's, that's what witticisms is. It comes from wit, right? So wit, um, yeah, you can have your you can have your wits about you, which is your sanity. We talk about people, you know. I could say Anthony has her wits about her, right? That means I'm saying she's smart, right? Um, but it's not just IQ; it's in the sense of right. So he so he's gone completely out of his wits. Means he's gone insane. Got that? The senses, that's an old name. Intellectual ability, faculty of thinking. Where she has gone is beyond the wit of man to say. Right? My ability to think quickly, mental cleverness, especially under short time, time right? My father had a quick wit and a steady hand, right? So, so that means fast thinker. It's very highly admired that, right? You can have somebody, and we sometimes describe people as being a bit slow. Not stupid, but a bit slow, right? Like, we bumped into this older man yesterday. He's retired now, walking down the street. And I made the comment, he's a bit slow. And my wife said, yeah, but he's all there, all right? And so what that exchange meant was, I'm saying he's a bit slow in his reaction. You say something and he's a bit ponderous before he comes back. But she said, he's all there. He asked about your motorbike. You still got your motorbike out. And so he knew I had a motorbike, right? This guy. So he's all there, right? So wit. Wit is brain power, but it's also fast wit, fast ability to come back. It also has this sense of humor, right? Especially being clever or quick. It's got this uh, quick, right? So the best man's speech was hilarious, full of wit and charm. In other words, he, the role of the best man is to, is to tell stories about the groom, right? That's his job at a wedding. And if you make people laugh because of the things you say, you would describe it as full of wit. A person who tells funny anecdotes or jokes, someone witty. Your friend is quite a wit, isn't he? So you see how they've turned it from you know, describing a person as a wit. So you can talk about wits, right? Everybody still with me? Yeah. 
So what we'll do now is we'll go to weather system then, right? So, so that's what wet is. So that leads us to weather system. A witty remark. A joke. A witty remark is usually a joke, right? So, but you know, you don't talk about telling witticisms, right? You tell jokes though, but you would describe something as a witticism. Oh, that was quite a witticism. Yeah. So, so we've done witticism and we've learned what wet is as well, right? So wet, And witticism. We've also done massacre, tantalize. Yeah, I would want to spell it with an S rather than a Z. Um, we've also did done cynicism, skepticism. We did a British spelling. We've done an inaugural. Genuflect. Melly. In peril. Acne. Right, XP it. Oh, there's a good word. XP it. Now, I would say the right answer here is payoff. Payoff. So let's let's check. It says to repent. Mm. Yeah, the Latin word is expiar to atone. Okay. I've only ever heard this word used in a religious context. It talks about expiation, which means turning away wrath. Satisfaction comes from Latin expiatio, which means satisfaction. The act of atonement for a sin or wrongdoing. Synonyms atonement, propitiation, obsolete, the act of expiating or stripping off. You're never going to come across this word ever. I mean, it's good that you know it. Expiate. It means to repent. Um, 11, detrimental. Um, harmful. So we talk about the detrimental effects of the medicine and the detrimental effects of um, the atmosphere, the detrimental effects, you know, something, something that in some way is harmful.
tending to cause harm. Recent policies have been detrimental to the interests of many old people. So that's quite an easy word, really. Detrimental. Um, there's a word that we've done before. It's in the same ballpark, which was deleterious. Do you remember that? Deleterious? Yeah. Somebody else has asked this question before. The adjectives, as adjectives, the difference between detrimental and deleterious is the detrimental is causing harm, damage, or harm. <clears throat> While deleterious is harmful often in a subtle or unexpected way. Okay, I don't I couldn't have I couldn't have I couldn't I couldn't have told you the difference. That that's excellent. Excellent. I've learned something here. I'll just write that in here. See, the word deleterious is often used with respect to medicine, right? So um, she is on some steroids uh, to knock out her immune system. but long-term usage will have detrimental effects on her health. Sorry. Yes, I could say that. But the often the expression would be would have deleterious effects on your health and therefore they're going to wean her off them. The doctor's going to wean her off the steroids. Now, so the word there to use is deleterious because deleterious says that the damage of the drugs is maybe not obvious. It's subtle, is the point. So that, that's a very good, helpful, I think, understanding the difference between these words, detrimental and deleterious. Right, charlatan. Anybody know what this is? It's a great word. I love this word. Thief, I think. Do you think it's a thief? Yeah, I think uh, we, we use the word in Farsi. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, it doesn't mean thief in the UK. You know, it doesn't mean thief. And um, the right answer here would be quack, but you probably don't know what a quack is. No. Yeah. Um, I have to say, so the typical usage of this, right, is somebody in America, in the Wild West, who's going around and he's selling you some medicine, right? And he says, this will cure everything, right? But take this medicine and it will, you'll live to a hundred, right? <laughs> or it'll, It'll, you'll never have a cold again if you take it, right? It's only $5 a bottle, right? <laughs> now, that person is a quack or a charlatan. So they are, they're, they're selling you something that is not real. It's not, right? So they're, they're, they're not genuine. Oh. Yeah? So let's look it up. Oh. A wicked person, right? What was that? Uh, a wicked person. Wicked. Wicked. Yeah, you could say that, but they're more a deceiver than outright wicked. Like you describe somebody who kills people as a as a wicked person, right? But this guy doesn't go around killing people, right? But he he's he's selling you something that is not the real deal. And he also is pretending knowledge that he doesn't have. He's pretending medical knowledge and he's not a doctor, right? Okay. There you go. A person falsely claiming to special knowledge or skill. A self-confessed con artist and charlatan. 
And you remember the other was, was the word quack and he says, a person practicing quackery, right? What does that mean? A person practicing quackery or a similar confidence trick in order to obtain money, fame or other advantages through pretense or deception. I use the word deceiving. Synonyms for Charlotte include shyster. That's an American word. We never say that in Britain, but we know the word because of American movies, right? Shyster. A quack, a faker. A quack is reference to quackery in the practice of dubious medicine. There we go. Including the sale of snake oil or a person who does not have actual medical training who purports to provide medical services. All right, what's snake oil? A term used to describe deceptive marketing, healthcare fraud, or a scam. Snake oil salesman is a common expression used to describe someone who sells, promotes, or is a general proponent of some valueless or fraudulent cure, remedy, or solution, right? And in the 1900s, this was a big thing, right? You know, there's all these people going around America selling all this stuff, right? And people were gullible. There's a good word, gullible. What does that mean? Yeah, it's like kind, kind, kind person who believes very easily. Yeah, exactly. Somebody who just, yeah, I, yeah, sure. Whatever you say, Anjali, I believe you, right? That's a gullible person. Yeah. Um, going back to charlatan, let's look up this word shyster, right? Um, I'll write down charlatan on here as well. Charlatan, hard word to say, to spell. Shyster. is a slang word for someone who acts in a disreputable, unethical, or unscrupulous way, especially in the practice of law. Sometimes that means also in Spanish. Um, sometimes also politics or business, shyster. I have to say, Okay, I'll let you read this statement here, the second paragraph. These scammers, scammers were disparagingly referred to as shizers, meaning worthless people in British slang, which in turn was originally derived from the German word Schieber. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. A book published in 2013 traces the first use back to 1843 when scammers in New York City would exploit prisoners by pretending to be lawyers. They, these scammers were disparaging for the shizers and shizers has become shyster. Um, we don't really say it in Britain though. If you call somebody a shyster, I don't know if they'd know what you meant. But in America, they'd know what you meant. And, and it doesn't have to be to do with law. It's just somebody who is deceitful, someone who's a deceiver, trying to scam other people, that's a shyster. Um... In Britain, we would say Charlotte, no. We would definitely say that word. Accessible. So accessible, the answer here is approachable, right? So it's like access, right? So somebody, if you can get access to somebody, you would say they're accessible. It's an attitude. He's an accessible guy or he's an accessible woman, even though she's very rich yet she's accessible and, and it means approachable, right? They'll, they'll talk to you. 
Is it a derogatory remark if, no. if we are saying that a woman is approachable? Is it no, 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 exact opposite. Exact opposite of that. It's somebody's accessible. It's good. They're 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 humble. They're approachable. They're meek. That that that's a very positive thing. If somebody's accessible, it means that no matter who you are, you can go and talk to them. I like to think I'm accessible, right? Approachable. I go out of my way to be approachable with people. 14, derelict. So this is a word for deserted. C, answer, correct answer is C, derelict. So you might describe a building as derelict, which means the building is, you know, it's, it's run down, there's nothing there. Or you could talk about a derelict town or a derelict city. You know, there's some places out in, in America, you don't get them in Britain at all, but in America, you, you can, they talk about ghost towns. Have you heard of that? A ghost town? No? Never heard of that? Right, so let's look up these words then. So let's look up, first of all, derelict. In a very poor condition as a result of misuse or neglect, a derelict Georgian mansion, right? Now, actually, I'm glad I looked at this one up in the dictionary because this is... Um, This is very common now, this usage here. I see it's North American. He was derelict in his duty to his country, right? So we do talk about dereliction of duty, right? Which means abandonment of duty. So, you know, it's like people have abandoned the time Talk about that, dereliction of duty. So, talking about a person who doesn't work, doesn't do anything, scumbag, derelict. A ship or other piece of property abandoned by the owner and in poor condition. She has been a derelict recommissioned for this journey. She being a ship. Ships are always described as female. In English, we don't have gender for most nouns. You know, you know, like, but in Spanish you do, right? Everything is male or female. But in English, we don't have that. However, there's a few exceptions, and the ship is one of them. The ship is always female. She. May God bless all who steal in her. Yeah. So, so that's what derelict is, okay? And the other word I, I, I mentioned was ghost time. So here's one here, an example of one in Plymouth Monster at um, And a ghost town or a deserted city or abandoned city is an abandoned village town or city that contains substantial visible remaining buildings and infrastructure such as roads, but nobody lives there, right? Nobody's there. If you want, it's spooky, right? 
that's why they call it a ghost town. Only people living here are ghosts, right? You can walk around it and there's nobody there. A town often becomes a ghost town because of economic activity that supported it, usually industrial agriculture has failed or due to natural or human disasters such as floods, droughts, extreme heat, cold, whatever. We don't have ghost towns in Britain at all, but we do have some abandoned islands on the west coast of Scotland where everybody's moved off the island and there's still some buildings there, but nobody lives there. So that's a ghost town. Now, so that's a strict definition, but we would also say ghost town metaphorically often. Um, so if you went into your office and there was nobody there, say, but one person, say, Anjali worked in the office as me and I walk in and there's Anjali at her desk, but there's nobody else here. I might remark, oh, it's a ghost town in here today. See that? It's a ghost town, but it's like a ghost town because there's nobody here. It's just you, Angela, you see? So, so that was there, like, stymie. Stymie is a great word, stymie. And it means to block, yeah, to block. So my attempts at promotion have been stymied. Prevent or hinder progress. The changes must not be allowed to stymie new medical treatments. Present an obstacle to, stand in the way of, stymied by red tape. Synonyms, cramp, embarrass, and clutter, fetter, hamper, handcuff, Hinder, impede, the good one, inhibit. Stymie, good word. We'll come back to some of these words in the next few weeks. So we, we go over them again to make sure everybody has got these words. Now, this word here, I, I knew it was reddish powder. I don't know how I knew that. Like, I knew that. I think it's because we would call a color rouge. Um, so it's, it's a red, basically. Yeah, various cosmetics for coloring the cheeks or lips red. A red powder consisting essentially of ferric oxide used in polishing glass, metal or gems, and as a pigment. In Farsi also we call lipstick a rouge. Oh do you? There you go. Yeah. The rest of blush history follows a pattern of aristocratic embrace and rejection, leaving rouge to the prostitutes and showgirls, and then lifting it back up to social, the social ladder. American beauties applied rouge as lip color and cheek color and used mascara for both lashes and brows. So obviously it comes in and out of fashion, lipstick, yeah. Um, and here, women would wear lipstick if they're going out, you know, to town and wanting to dress up. They wouldn't typically wear it really strong colored anyway in the office. They would wear light makeup though. Many do, not all. Some women don't want to do that. Some like to try and improve their appearance a little bit. So it's just up to the individual. But people don't go heavy on the makeup unless they're like going to a party, you know. 
Um, and the girls who do wear makeup tend to wear it every day. Right? But it's very much a personal thing. So that's rouge. We've got rouge. Culpable, great word. And this means guilty, guilty, right? Um, so the dictionary says, meriting condemnation or blame, especially as wrong or harmful. Culpable negligence is an expression. The defendant is culpable for actions what those men did that was culpable, right? They're culpable for that. Right? It was their fault. Yeah, we have a word also, we have a word culprit, right? The culprit, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. The one who did it. Mm -hmm. Okay. We'll finish when we get to end of this page because that's nearly two hours, believe it or not. Laudatory. The answer here is complimentary, A. Laudatory, think of laudits or plaudits. All relating to expressing praise. The play received mostly laudatory reviews. Examples. McAuliffe had attempted to make that harder for Yunkin uh, by tying him to Trump at every turn, jumping on laudatory comments Trump has made about the Republican nominee and using similar comments Youngkin has made about Trump and his ads. So there's the expression there, jumping on laudatory comments Trump has made. That's praise basically. This is why contemporary books about presidents, Ulysses Grant and Harry Truman take a different and far more laudatory view other subjects and do books written closer to their lifetime. That's kind of interesting statement. I would like to actually go and read that statement. I would like to read the, the rationale is missing there, right? I'd like to read the previous sentence or two. Okay, is everybody clear on laudatory? Mm -hmm. I often give you guys laudatory comments, don't I? I praise you when you do well. And it's not disingenuous, right? It's sincere. <laughs> right, pathos, there's a lovely word, pathos. I like this word, pathos. And this means sympathy, okay? And a good thing to understand is the difference between pathos, sympathy, empathy. At the heart of the words empathy and sympathy is the Greek word pathos, which means suffering, experience or emotion. Borrowed directly into English in the 16th century, pathos usually refers to an emotions produced by tragedy or the depiction of tragedy. Tragedy also plays a big part in both sympathy and empathy. I won't go into sympathy and empathy just yet, but you know, I might comment, oh, the pathos of the moment, right? It's like sadness. Yes, it's suffering, but it's sadness, the pathos, right? 
right? Empathy. It's very important to understand the difference between sympathy and empathy. The word sympathy is used more frequently than empathy. Both are pretty common. Actually, more common than pathos, which is the root. Empathy. The N prefix means in or within, becomes an M when it precedes a P. Who knew? I didn't know that. I didn't know it was really N pathy, N pathos, in other words. Add it to pathos and you get empathy. I couldn't have told you that. That is amazing, in my opinion. So I'll copy it in the chat. Right? I didn't know that. If you look at the word in Miriam Webster's Collegiate Dictionary, you'll find that what I believe is a great example of a rather long definition. It seems overly descriptive and torturous, but actually contains not a single extraneous word. So I'll quote it here in full. Well, that's a laudatory comment, if ever there was one. The action of understanding, being aware of, being sensitive to, and vicariously experiencing the feelings, thoughts, and experience of another, of either the past or present, without having the feelings, thoughts, and experiences fully communicated in an objectively explicit manner. Wow. Let's take our time over this, right? So Mona might tell me about some situation in her life, right? And if I can feel it, right? if I imbibe her suffering in this situation, I am showing empathy. Right? Does that make sense? So, that, so, so, in fact, I'm going to explain this Alan's way, right? And I learned recently in my Spanish that in Spanish, to say sorry, you say lo siento, lo siento. That means I'm sorry. I am sorry, right? And the direct meaning of lo siento is I feel it. So Mona might tell me all oh, this terrible things happened, this terrible tragedy. It was a car accident and da 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 da, da right? Now, if I'm Spanish, Espanol, I might say lo siento which means, I'm sorry, but at the root of it, it really means I feel it. I feel it. In other words, I am feeling what you're feeling. I am suffering too. You're suffering and I'm suffering. That is what empathy is, okay? The action of understanding, being aware and sensitive to vicariously, which means in your place, like by proxy, as if I'm suffering it too. The feelings, thoughts, and experience of another, either the past or present, without having fully communicated, without the person having to tell me every detail. I just get it, right? That's what empathy is. That, that I agree with this person. That is a great definition, right? What else does he say? What jumped out at me first in this definition is that the first conjugation is and, not, or. Okay, very um, astute comment, right? So what he's commenting here on is that and right and he's saying that most things when they're defining it says it means this or this or this or this or this it's a or b or c or d yeah but he's saying that it's 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 understanding 
being aware and sensitive and vicariously experiencing, right? So that's a very rich definition and he thinks that's fantastic and I agree with him. I think it's fantastic as well, right? Really good definition of empathy. And I know we started in pathos, but basically you don't say pathos in English very much, but you do say empathy. It's the root word for empathy or sympathy. Exactly, or it, exactly, exactly. The two words that follow Can up we... once to remember though, having empathy means vicariously experiencing someone else's emotional state, not just recognizing and understanding someone's emotion, but actually feeling them. Now, okay, one, one question. Go ahead. Uh, can, we use, can we use the expression for empathy that getting into uh, someone's shoes? If we're empathetic, then we can say that getting into someone's shoes. You could. Okay. It's not ideal. And the reason it's not ideal is we talk about getting into somebody's shoes, but not with respect to empathy. What we mean by that is, is as a general statement, having the experiences of another person. Like for example, there's quite a famous quote by Nelson Mandela on this. Let's look it up. And I've always liked this. I, I just want the quote. I don't want all this sh stuff. Um, I can't just find it. Um, Is it uh, you can't understand someone until you yeah you it, work with uh, in their shoes? Yes, it, it's basically okay. something like you can't criticize. I think that's the sentiment. You can't criticize a, ta a man until unless you've watched him walk the mile in the shoes. That's really mm -hmm. the, the 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 quote I'm looking for. I can't just put my hand on it. Um, There you go, find it. Uh, typed in all these bits, got it. You can't understand someone until you've walked a mile in their shoes. I think that's what you said, you were right. Okay, so basically, to back to Anjali's, Anjali's point, is, is being in their shoes empathy. And I said, it's not great because when we describe walking in the shoes, it's doing, having the same experiences generally. Okay. Right. 
coming back then to, we've done empathy, now do sympathy. Similarly to N, the prefix sin means along with. Something becomes sim when it precedes a P. I didn't know that. I didn't know these wee clue things here. I didn't know that. Sympathy and its forms of broad usage in English a broader usage other than, than empathy does, I agree. Finding usage in physics, biology, public debate, Nazi sympathies, and even magic, sympathetic magic. I learned this evening, magic based on the assumption that a person or thing can be supernaturally affected through its name or an object representing it. I don't know what that means. But where the choices between empathy and sympathy, the definition we're concerned with is the act or capacity of entering into or sharing the feelings of another. The phrase entering into or sharing, probably intentionally vague here. After all, if two people share a milkshake, they both experience exactly the same touch and taste sensations. With that type of sharing in mind, sympathy seems like a straightforward synonym for empathy. But what it's missing is that vicarious experience of empathy. Sympathy means understanding how a person feels and why they feel it, but not actually that person's emotions. Okay, so here's, here's Alan's pulling that apart, right? They both are to do with pathos and this idea of caring about somebody else's situation. They're both got to do with that. But with sympathy, the key thing is I understand it. So Anjali tells me about this terrible tragedy, right? And, and if I can say, yeah, I understand that, I am showing sympathy. I understand. I understand what you're saying. That's it. But I'm not suffering. But if I've got empathy, not only do I understand it, I also am suffering alongside you. So people with high EQ tend to be very empathetic and people who are empathetic can't help themselves. Right? They just, as they communicate with other people, they take on their emotions. So empathy is a very powerful thing. Okay, I feel we've done that one to death. We've got it, right? We started in pathos and we've done two other words. Okay, great. Right, last one, sinusure. Sinusure, now, sinusure was the only one on that whole list that I didn't recognize, I didn't know. And I think it means selfishness. Let's see. Center of attention or attraction. No, so it's D is the answer, D. I need to learn this word, D, center of attention. Center of attention or attraction. Cinderella was the sinusure of the ball, former name of the constellation containing the North Star. Ah, okay. So the center of attention. So it's not pejorative. Kirk was the sinusure of all eyes. Sinusure. Sinusure, they're pronouncing it. Sinusure. 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 Okay. Sinusure. Ah, so I was pronouncing it like the Americans. 
Sinusure. Sinusure. <clears throat> One that serves to direct or guide a center of attraction or attention. They've turned all, they've turned an eyesore into a sinusure. His rapidly increasing wealth has made him a sinusure in political circles. So you can just think of it as the center of attention. And we, we talk, we say center of attention a lot. Right, he is a center of attention, or she is a center of attention. We do not say sinusure or sinusure. I not can't, have not come across that word in my life until I came across it in that quiz. Right. But a good one to know. Yeah. Nice word. Sinusure in American speak, sinusure, or sinusure in British speak. Either way, you're going to be you're going to be understood anyway. Either way. Okay. Hope that was fun. Two hours ten minutes. <laughs> right. So we've recorded it. Uh, so we'll. Uh, We'll end the recording. Let me do that. Let me take a minute. Just hang on. Uh, stop share. No, I didn't want to do that. I want to stop the recording. That's what I'm going to do.